The next perfection that we're looking at in Shantideva's text is meditative absorption. But before we turn to that chapter, I want to remind you again that this is a manual we're reading. And before we get to practicing meditative absorption, Shantideva would have us also practice the perfection of vigor, which comes right before this chapter in chapter 7. And he opens chapter 7 by saying, Patient in this way, one should cultivate vigor, because awakening depends on vigor. Now, this first verse tells us that what comes in chapter 7 is dependent on being patient. We can't just selectively pick out a few of the perfections to practice because they're interdependent. We've already talked some about the importance of cause and effect for Shantideva, and the fact that he connects perfections in this way should make us curious about how cause and effect work for our ethical lives. What kinds of mental states and habits are necessary for others, and why? With that in our background, let's turn to chapter 8. You're only assigned a small section of the chapter, but notice that the beginning of this chapter starts just like the beginning of chapter 7, by making a connection to the previous section. He says, Increasing one's endeavor in this way, one should stabilize the mind in meditative concentration, since a person whose mind is distracted stands between the fangs of the defilements. In fact, some commentators make it explicit that the term increasing refers to having increased or having developed vigor, which is the subject of the last chapter. Vigor, or what Stephen Harris calls energetic effort, is the discipline to begin and to stay committed to a task. The bodhisattva path is not easy, and it requires this discipline of stamina, of vigor, to continue. So, as we undertake perfecting our meditative absorption or concentration, we are supposed to have already begun to cultivate patience and stamina, both of which will be necessary for the tough practice of sitting and meditating. Now, if you know anything about meditation, you might think it's primarily about noticing your breath or about sitting quietly and calmly. While both of these things can be true, in this particular context, we need to be clear about two different meditative practices. The meditative practice we're looking at in verses 90 to 103 is for developing the awakened mind, as Shantideva says in verse 89. And this is known as insight meditation, or vipassana in Sanskrit. This kind of meditation is a practice that enables the meditator to come to understand key Buddhist ideas. But before this kind of meditation is introduced, Shantideva has discussed calming meditation, uh, shama in Sanskrit. And this is a sort of meditation that allows the aspiring bodhisattva to reduce her distractions and to achieve a state of mind conducive to gaining insight. So it's with this context that we start the section from verses 90 to 103, which are quite famous. Yeah, well, the, chapter 8 is extremely complicated. <laughs> I mean, it's a wonderful chapter. I think it's actually structurally the hardest of the text. One of the reasons I wanted to talk with Stephen Harris about this part of the text is that he's changed his mind about what it means. This shows us that even people with a lot of philosophical and philological training can change their understandings of the text. And if they can do that, certainly those of us who aren't experts in a text can read it and change our understanding over time, and in fact probably we should expect that. Now, one big question about this part of the text, given that it's in a chapter on meditation, is whether we should understand it to be giving an argument for a conclusion, or if it is instead simply a meditation. So let's take a look at the text. Here's how it starts. At first, one should meditate intently on the equality of oneself and others as follows. All equally experience suffering and happiness. I should look after them as I do myself. Now, Dr. Harris used to think that we should understand this and what follows not as an argument, but instead as a meditation. And there are two reasons for this. First is the principle of charity. This is the idea that we should try to interpret other people's words in a way that makes the best out of what they say. We assume, for instance, that other people are intelligent, especially philosophers and political theorists like those we're reading in this class. And so we might think if they give an argument, it should be a compelling one, maybe even one that's successful. Early on, with one of my very early publications, I argued that 
the argument doesn't work, first of all. I still have some doubts about the argument. The other reason we might think this section isn't an argument is because of what the goal of the passage and the chapter as a whole seems to be. And then second, I thought what he really seems interested in here is developing compassion and eliminating selfishness. So we should characterize it as a meditation. So we might think that if interpreting a section of text as an argument doesn't work, and the section of text also seems to be aiming at cultivating ethical characteristics, well, maybe we should abandon the interpretation that it's an argument. You can talk in more detail in your sections about this, but let's at least start to understand how we might interpret this as an argument and see whether it works. So this is going to involve what's called argument reconstruction. Argument reconstruction involves taking the text, understanding its meaning, and then putting that meaning into a recognizable argument form that matches the text's aims. Now, it's important not to skip the first step. After all, there might be more than one thing which is meant in a section of text. Very often, sentences can't be converted directly into premises and conclusions. Let me give you one way of reconstructing the main argument in this section of the text. And I'll just warn you that I'm not going to show you all of the steps in getting to this argument from the text. I'll let you work that out in your sections and on your own. Now, this way of understanding this section takes verse 103 to involve a conclusion. To get to this conclusion involves one sub-argument, or an argument whose conclusion then forms a premise in a second argument. So here's the argument. First premise. If there is no enduring unified self, then it is irrational to prefer my well-being over that of others. There is no enduring unified self. Thus, it is irrational to prefer my well-being over that of others. And this conclusion we'll call no special concern. This is the idea that I shouldn't prefer my well-being over others. I shouldn't have a special concern for myself above others. So the next argument takes this conclusion as part of its first premise. If there is no special concern, then we should remove all suffering or we should remove no suffering. There is no special concern, thus we should remove all suffering or we should remove no suffering. Now this is our interpretive hypothesis. We're going to suppose this is what Shanti Deva is doing in verses 90 to 103, that it's a good uh, representation of what he's doing. Now let's apply the principle of charity and ask, is this a good argument? In this sense, is it one that we could attribute to him without also attributing some bad reasoning to him? Where I still kind of struggle with it being wholly successful simply as an intellectual argument, it, in the, throughout the text outside the set of passages, he places enormous emphasis on the conventional self. So Buddhists don't wholly reject selves. There's no Atman. There's no enduring unified self. But persons exist as these streams of causally connected mental and physical events that we conceptually label. We kind of conceptually aggregate and we label them with names. Um, and, you know, the Bodhisattva is one of these conventional people and the people he's trying to save is one of these people. This general background is familiar to you from last semester with Nagasena's chariot simile. There's no enduring self that the word Nagasena refers to. Instead, we decide in agreement with each other uh, through conventions that we'll call this set of events, this kind of cluster of causes and effects, Nagasena. Even though there's nothing essentially Nagasena-ish about them, we've just grouped some connections together for our convenience. I'm, I'm still kind of sympathetic to this earlier point. It seems like the tension Shanti that ever has in this argument is that he has to deeply de-emphasize the importance of the conventional self in order to get this conclusion of universal benevolence, no greater priority to my own well-being. But if he does that, then he seems in sharp tension with the rest of his text. In other words, it seems as if interpreting this section of text as an argument might not fit with other parts of Shanti Davis' text. After all, while it's true that there is ultimately no Shanti Deva, there's ultimately no you and me, what Shanti Deva is doing in this text is explaining how to be a bodhisattva in the realm of the conventional, the world of samsara. So why would he focus on ultimate reality and the lack of enduring selves in order to motivate this kind of action? So there are issues then with whether this argument coheres with the rest of the text. If it doesn't, Perhaps we should abandon the interpretation that it's an argument.
Maybe, but we've seen this issue before in PPT. Perhaps there are ways to interpret what Shantideva is doing so that moving to the level of the ultimate is part of his meditative purposes here. After all, the fact that we can motivate the removal of suffering by appeal to conventional reality doesn't mean we always have to do it in that way. Perhaps there's a reason that we should meditate on this ultimate level in this particular context. That's a thing you can talk about in your discussion sections. And this question then brings us to the other question, that of textual goals. If what Shanti Deva wants to do in this section of text is to teach us a meditative practice, isn't that inconsistent with his giving an argument? Ten years later, I agree with that second point. I think he is primarily interested in developing compassion and eliminating selfishness. But I think what I understand better about the text now is he sees argumentation as one of several ways of doing that. And in this particular case, getting these conceptual connections right and then meditating upon them will lessen suffering, uh, will lessen selfishness, and will develop compassion. On this interpretation, then, what's going on is an argument and it's a meditation. After having read Descartes, maybe this idea isn't so strange to you, even if the kind of Buddhist meditation going on here is in many ways different than the Cartesian sort. Here's what Dr. Harris now thinks. He thinks this is an argument, even if he still has questions about how it fits with the rest of the text. But he thinks it may also have other functions. So why does he think it's an argument? Here's the most important reason. Um, so in this particular case, why is it an argument? Well, because he gives premises, he states a conclusion, and he draws the links between the premises and the conclusion. And eventually, that's why now when I talk about it, I say whatever else it is and whatever its function is, it is also an argument. Now, after hearing this discussion, maybe you agree with the earlier causal bundle that we call conventionally Stephen Harris. And you don't think that 90 to 103 is an argument. Or maybe you think that it is. Either way, now you've seen a little bit of an example of how you can think through what a section of text is doing and how that requires looking both at the details of that particular section of text and its larger context. So let's wrap up by taking up a few outstanding questions about Shanti Deva 